I'm Harry, Advanced Ball Cardiologist and Clinical Trialist at ESC 2025, and it is my distinct pleasure to have Professor Attar and Professor Christensen. You were the co-chair of the Batami Dan Block trial. You were the project coordinator of the Dan Block trial, and we're all here to discuss your late-breaking clinical trial presentation. Welcome, congratulations. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Perhaps I'll start with you, Professor Attar. Um, give us a bit of background uh, that informed your study question. And then I'll pivot to you and ask about the logistics of coordinating these two separate trials into one big trial. Thank you. Sure. So the uh, background is quite obvious to many cardiologists, the fact that beta blockers have been re recommended for um, decades for post-MI patients. That is based on old trials that has shown that they have a better survival, but they have a survival benefit. They have less um, MACE, uh, like reinfarctions. And all that led to the fact that they were firmly established in the guidelines as a recommendation. However, as we all know, the times have changed in terms of AMI diagnostication, revascularization, uh, post-MI secondary prevention, all these factors have changed the entire population. So many cardiologists asked themselves, are they actually still indicated post-MI? Right. And so you have these uh, two countries uh, that, that we love uh, and that we collaborate with, but you decided to merge two trials together to answer your question. And so perhaps you can tell me, Dr. Christensen, what that entailed. Yes, we performed two trials, the Norwegian Bitami trial and the Danish uh, Danblock trial, both of them investigating the effects of beta blocker therapy after MI. And they were orig originally two trials, but during COVID, uh, the inclusion rate declined and we decided to to combine the trials. And it was more than four years from in the forward, so that was you know, a long time ago. And we decided to merge the trials in which they were more or less alike in inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, and then we harmonized the endpoints. Right, and they were both probe designed, so you have a prospective open label, blinded endpoint design. Did you have to do any protocol amendments in order to merge them? Yes, we had to to harmonize the endpoints. Okay. So we decided to to have a, a primary composite endpoint of uh, all cause mortality in a major adverse cardiovascular events, mm -hmm. including uh, MI, heart failure unplanned coronary revascularization, stro ischemic stroke, and unplanned revascularization. Okay, and they were funded separately, peer-reviewed funding, which is probably why they were separate trials. Um, and were they both registry-based trials? Yes, they were. So in both Denmark and in, Nor in Norway, we have the registries. So we follow the patients in the registries. Mm -hmm. And if they had an endpoint, you sent that endpoint to the uh, adjudication committee mm -hmm. to adjudicate this uh, endpoint. So, so we had, we know, you know, it was register based, but we had a blinded endpoint evaluation as well. Okay, Professor Tar, tell me uh, about the eligibility criteria and then the baseline characteristics in this combined. So, this this study has had as a, as an entry criteria an, an MI. And the randomization had to occur within 14 days after the index event. And what we found was a um, relatively typical post-MI population with a mean age of 63, 22% um, women, um, a um, LVEF that was uh, in 16% in, in of the cases reduced, mildly reduced. Uh, the others had above 50% of LVEF. And, you know, the, the classical um, risk factors for atherosclerosis. Uh, however, not so many comorbidities that you would expect, let's say, in an all-comer trial of current MI patients. Okay. And tell me about your intervention and follow-up period. 
Yes, we randomized patients one-to-one -to, -one to either beta blocker therapy or no beta blocker therapy. Mm -hmm. And it was an open-label trial, so both the patient and the doctor knew in which arm the patient were randomized to. Mm -hmm. If patients were randomized to the beta blocker therapy, then the drug or which type of beta blocker uh, and the dose was at the sh discretion of the treating cardiologist. Mm -hmm. So patients were not randomized to dosing regimes or a uh, a type of beta blocker. Okay, so quite pragmatically delivered intervention. And what was the follow-up period? We had a median follow-up period of 3.5 years. And as Prinusen stated, we followed them in the registries with subsequent adjudication. And then we um, also contacted the patients with patient-related outcomes as well. So we had some follow-up uh, with patient-related outcomes, but not you know, uh, on-site visits. So we were not able to, you know, perform blood pressure, pulse, follow-up uh, echocardiography. Uh, right. So beautifully pragmatic uh, and streamlined without much research burden on clinicians and patients. Uh, Professor Tar, tell me the sample size, the number of events, and then the primary treatment effect. Yes, that's the that's the nice part. Uh, we had a, a power calculation in in place, which um, had a, an an estimation of nine hundred fifty endpoints in order to power the trial with an eighty percent at a hazard ratio of point eight three. Um, it was a superiority trial. We wanted to give the beta blockers the chance to show their superiority. You know, against all odds, you could say. And um, then the primary endpoint was all-cause mortality in MACE was achieved in favor of beta blocker therapy at, at a hazard ratio of 0.85 and with a p-value of significance at 0.03. That's remarkable and perhaps unexpected by some, I would say. What was the drop-in rate of beta blocker therapy? We have looked very much at, because we also have access to the um, prescription registry, the nationwide. So the drop-off rate was surprisingly little. People were relatively faithful to the um, allocation. Crossover rate, not so much. It was um, in total an adherence around 89% in both groups, which was also surprising to us. And what was the uptake of background therapies, antiplatelets, statin? Of course, completely state of the art. Okay. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Um, tell me about some secondary endpoints uh, and findings, our confirmatory findings. Yes. Our secondary endpoint was the individual components of the pathomary endpoints mm -hmm. and we looked at them separately and we found that beta blocker therapy significantly uh, reduced the risk of recurrent MI. Mm -hmm. um, that was a bit surprisingly. We didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the old trials, this was also the non fatal endpoint uh, decreased by beta blocker therapy in the old landmark trial. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the endpikes. And we didn't see any difference in on planned coronary revascularization, heart failure. Uh, malignant ventricular arrhythmias. Mm -hmm. We had a very few events of malignant ventricular arrhythmias, mm -hmm. so that should be noted. And then we saw a numerically higher, though not significant, um, number of uh, ischemic stroke in the beta blocker compared to the no beta blocker. Okay, and how about DAF? It was the same. Okay, DAF. Um, and so what about the quality of life measures that you mentioned? We're actually working on them at the moment. Mm -hmm. And so we are looking at anxiety and depression, mm -hmm. sexual dysfunction, uh, quality of life mm -hmm. and insomnia and, you know, um, with cold hands and feet and stuff like that. Okay. And we haven't finished the papers yet, but they will um, now be submitted soon, hopefully. <laughs> Professor Tar, tell us. Uh, about this tension between your trial findings and the reboot trial findings and how do you put these results in the context of the reboot trial? Yeah, so the, the, the really exciting thing in this whole topic is the fact that we knew about each other's trials and we actually connected early on because we had a vision and in fact 
Dr. Ibanez had the ma ma major vision that perhaps if we have a good timing, one day we will be able to have this back-to-back -back published and even side-by-side -side, um, presented. And that really turned out. <laughs> that was he, he's a visionary man. So so there was of course a big surprise when Anameta um presented the data to each other from our side to them and the other way around. And we were just smiling because that is that is science, you know. We must be aware that, that these are two different populations investigated and you, you cannot always expect the same outcome. Uh, that said, some of this was reconciled by this meta-analysis where we looked at this particular subgroup between 40 and 50% of LVEF. And there we found out that our study results match very well. And for the part above 50%, that we must analyze further. Okay, so the reboot trial had a neutral treatment effect on their primary endpoint in a very similar patient population. Their trial was executed in Spain and Italy, but you're saying that the differences may be explained by the EF range or for any given EF, the findings were similar? I think the differences must be elucidated further, but it is clear that our populations were, of course, not exactly the same. Our population was a little bit high, more high risk, um, more uh, a older age, and so on. Did you have more events? Yeah, we did. That could partly be it. Um, okay, well, congratulations to two of you, and um, congratulations on this remarkably pivotal trial, not just testing the efficacy or effect of a drug, but also bringing forth these new methodologies that allow for countries to collaborate on trials, right? And to um, generate a true meaningful partnership, both to build relationships, but also to give us the statistical efficiency needed to answer these questions. Hard to do in investigator-initiated trials. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much.